we can't afford to lose even the first kilometer because we'll probably never be able to take it back. I think the Ukraine war, if it continues, will look different. Will, will we see more maybe robots deployed? Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about Terminator style robots, uh, you know, instead of uh, uh, troops. Will we see lasers? Could we see, you know, other types of drones than we're seeing right now? Maybe like drone swarms that we've seen in some movies? Mm. Yeah, all these things are under development. We can see the lasers are already deployed in some places and being used for air defense. It's a very good system for shooting down enemy drones, for example, or uh, um, incoming missiles and these things. So that's the idea that you can use lasers for that. And sh instead of shooting things down with missiles, you can shoot it down with lasers. The challenge with lasers is that you need so much energy that you basically have to have your own power plant next to this laser, right? So, uh, it's not something that you can re easily build into to a drone, for example, that will shoot laser beams, like the, like Star Wars kinds of, like, it, it's, it's something that's very stationary right now. And the range is not super great. But it's definitely something that is coming. Um, the drones warms as well. We're already seeing that. Uh, and it's one of those developments happening right now where more and more drones become able to coordinate their actions in air and uh, to communicate about attacking some target. Uh, we are seeing the development. A lot of that is going is right now happening with the, you know, the development of what, what we can call motherships, where you have a big drone that can sort of release a bunch of smaller drones that actually do the, the kill. Um, there is a constant battle over the electronics uh, spectrum. Uh, so what is called electronic warfare is really important. Uh, and it's this thing about how do you jam the frequencies that the enemy uses while you keep the frequencies open that you use. And, you know, in time and space, how do you make it impossible for the enemy to operate during that time slot when you plan your attack and those things. So, so these are, th this is going on constantly all the time, uh, very rapid development. Something that's very big and that, that I think would happen if, if this continues for another five years is that I think we would see the ground drones. We would see much of that development that has been happening in flying drones uh, will also be happening on the ground. I don't think they would be necessarily walking like Terminator kinds of robots, uh, but, but sort of remote controlled vehicles that can solve different tasks on on the ground i think that that's really something that's coming within the coming years and the ukrainians have an ambition of move, removing more and more soldiers from the, the front line and have robots taking over that task which is the most dangerous one um so i i mean i guess ultimately we are approaching a time when there are no soldiers at all in the front line and it's just robots fighting against each other uh there um, but so, so that's, that's something that's really happening, uh, a lot right now. Uh, one of the very big challenges about having these robots operating, uh, is the, how, how do you distinguish between different types of targets? For example, how do you make something you, you, it would be fairly easy to have a robot with a machine gun and then just train to shoot, a, you know, identify a human being and then shoot at that. But how do you distinguish between enemy combatants and civilians, for example? And you have all these challenges. Um, so I, I think in the beginning, it's probably, it, it's not going to be really shooting, fighting uh, robots like that, but it would be different tasks, um, logistics, mine laying, mines, sort of mine hunting, these things, um, uh, that, that's very much under development right now. Evacuation of wounded, um, also something. But how autonomous do, do you think, uh, warfare can become? I mean, I, I listened to this guy, Palmer Luck, and, and so he's talking a lot about like autonomous warfare. And, and he's given examples uh, uh, of, of, for example, if China were to um, to attack Taiwan, like, 
you know, if, if the U.S. stay ahead and are truly autonomous in, in the way drones are operated, uh, then that would be a major advantage. How much do you think it matters to kind of make that shift? Um, I, I mean, it's an inevitable development, I think, because everyone wants, you know, if, if you can have your wep- your weapons fight for themselves and, and not put any of your soldiers in harm's way, then that's definitely better. Uh, so I, I, and there are a lot of ethical considerations about this. And I touched on it before about how, how, how much decision-making can we delegate to a robot about who to kill and, you know, who gets to live and who, who dies, right? Is, is these kinds of ethical decisions. And there are also, uh, decisions about humanitarian international law and those things about it. But technologically, that is the way that things are going. Um, one of the very big challenges that we're going to be facing is that this technology on overall tends to favor the defender. Uh, so, um, I, I think the big challenge for the defense industry of our time is to find out how do we still conduct offensive operations in, in this type of drone saturated environment. Um, because we cannot, I mean, if, if we go into a period of time where it's not possible to actually achieve anything and, and we can't engage in any type of offensive operations, then we, um, it will be, yeah, that, that, that would be, it would be difficult. Right. Let's say that to, uh, you know, to, to exercise power in any, in any kind of way, a lot of the, if we just take the, you know, you know what, how is NATO planning on conducting operations? A lot of it is right now based on an assumption that if Russia were to attack a NATO country, for example, then NATO would be able to reinforce or to, 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 you know, set up this, this force and then go and liberate that country. But in an environment where the technology to that extent favors the defender, then you might very, very quickly run into a kind of fair, complete situation where it's just not possible. It's not feasible to liberate a country that has been occupied, right? Because the, the enemy will be able to build these very, very strong defensive lines. So it, it, it's, it's, and it, it would be the same thing about, you know, other other conflicts, uh, Korea scenario, or you, you know, you you run into to the, the, so 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 there is a very big challenge here. If we if we can't conduct offensive operations in the future, then we will have to focus on being ready to fight uh, all wars defensively, and that will require much more capabilities, m- many more soldiers actually being present constantly on um, on on the. F- potential front line because we can't afford to lose even the first kilometer because we'll probably never be able to take it back. So I think that's one of the big challenges, figuring out how can we still conduct offensive operations in the 